Good afternoon, and welcome to the Jewish Policy Center webinar. I am Shoshana Bryan, Senior Director of the JPC and your host. Before we go to our guest, Mark Mills, here is your JPC commercial. So people ask me why, as we are well into our fourth year of webinar programming, and so many of you come back so often, why I'm still doing the commercial. Thank you for asking, because it allows me a chance to brag in two different ways. First of all, about the JPC, and second to say that there are new people on this call every week, and that's great, and you can help. So please circulate your webinar invitation to your friends, and let's grow the circle. The JPC was established in 1985 as a 501c3 organization, providing analysis of both foreign and domestic policies. You can find us on our website, jewishpolicycenter.org, and there you can sign up for our Insight articles, and you can read our quarterly magazine, In Focus. The summer domestic issue of In Focus is up now, but if you haven't seen them, winter and spring of 2024 address the issues raised for American Jews following October 7th, and also the war against Hamas itself. Again, you can find it at jewishpolicycenter.org. The JPC supports a strong American defense capability, U.S.-Israel security cooperation, and missile defense. Right now, our most important job is to support the legitimacy and security of the state of Israel against anyone who would deny them. And now more than ever, we support the government of Israel and the IDF in their defense of their people, in bringing the rest of the perpetrators of October 7th to justice, in making Hamas and its fellow travelers release the hostages, and ultimately in bringing a, um, an end to the malign influence of the mullahs of Iran, both for Israel's sake and for a broad regional peace. As an organization that sits slightly to the right of center, the JPC advocates for small government, low taxes, free trade, fiscal responsibility, energy security, free speech, and intellectual diversity. And now, today's program. I've been asked, why are you promoting nukes? <laughs> Fair enough. For good reason, when we think about nukes, we give most of our attention to weaponization and to Iran. And the consequences of rogue powers having nuclear weapons are terrifying, especially today, especially in the context of war in the Middle East. Our guest today, Mark Mills, wrote about nuclear energy in the summer domestic issue of In Focus Quarterly. And I found it fascinating. And actually, I found it strangely comforting. Chalk it up to summer, right? <clears throat> but there is another side to the nuclear equation. Nuclear power is low carbon, renewable, clean, and domestic. Like all energy sources, it has drawbacks, including a poor public profile. So <laughs> let's go there. Let's talk about it. Mark Mills is the executive director of the National Center for Energy Analytics, a distinguished senior fellow at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, a contributor at City Journal, a faculty fellow at Northwestern University School of Engineering, and co-founding partner of Montrose Lane. His online PragerU videos have been viewed more than 10 million times. His most recent book is The Cloud Revolution, How the Convergence of New Technologies Will Unleash the Next Economic Boom and a Roaring 2020s. I love the title. I hope <laughs> it works. He's also the author of Digital Cathedrals, Work in the Age of Robots, and The Bottomless Well, about which Bill Gates said, this is the only book I've ever seen that really explains energy. I need that book. <laughs> Mark served as President Reagan's, uh, in President Reagan's White House uh, in the science office, and he was uh, an experimental physicist and development engineer in microprocessors and fiber optics, earning several patents. His degree is in physics from Queen's University in Canada. And with that, Mark Mills, the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you, Shoshana. I appreciate that. And uh, thank you for the uh, generous introduction. Um, well, let me frame the answer to the nuclear question in a high, a sort of a high level uh, context with regard to energy in general, because that's why we, we talk about nuclear energy. And it's very relevant to the Middle East. As you said, uh, the longstanding physics linkage between nuclear weapons and commercial nuclear energy has been unavoidable. I mean, a, the early language, as you know, was taming 
hey, mean the atom, the peaceful atom, because the introduction of the understanding of nuclear physics began horrifically with nuclear weapons, and they are terrible weapons. I've studied the nature of those weapons, uh, worked in nonproliferation issues when I was in the Reagan White House Science Office, and since. So this is a serious issue in that, in that sense. It links us directly to Iran and the tensions over preventing the proliferation to unfriendly and rogue states of having nuclear weapons. Something, by the way, I would say, interestingly enough, uh, the weapon states generally, that is the existing weapon states, Russia, China, uh, Britain, France, do not want rogue states having, including Russia. They don't. I think it may be naive of me to say, but over the decades, I think it's pretty clear behind the scenes that none of the players that have nuclear weapons want really want rogue states to have them. Unfortunately, North Korea has, has them. The Middle East is also relevant because it is uh, beyond obvious. It is the dominant player in global oil markets. The, the creation of OPEC in, in the 20th century was a direct result of the discovery of, by the West and the expansion by the United States, principally in Britain, of the great Gawar oil fields of Saudi Arabia. The uh, biggest single expansion of the addition of energy to the world uh, until the 21st century, the biggest expansion ever in the history of the world, again, until the 21st century, was the opening of the Gawar oil fields, supplying oil to the world. It had the largest expansion of energy for the world at lowest cost in the fastest, shortest time period ever in history until the shale field revolution in America, which started <clears throat> roughly 2007 in the 21st century. And over that decade led to a larger expansion uh, and faster expansion of uh, addition of energy to the world than at any time in history, bigger than the Gawar field, upset and changed the entire ecosystem of global energy markets. But we're a free market with prohibitions legally against conspiring on prices in America, which means that there is an organization called OPEC, which was formed to openly conspire on production and prices. So it creates a very interesting tension, but at the epicenter of combat is the Middle East. And Iran is one of the biggest oil and gas producers on the planet as well. So the the relationship between energy, nuclear energy and oil is, is inextricable. It's inherent in the nature of these uh, the physics of energy. And it's for better or for worse, often for worse, it finds its epicenter frequently in the Middle East. And that it colors everything about why we're in the Middle East, why we care, why America cares. Even though Israel is an ally, this has been a longstanding challenge for the United States and Israel, the back behind the scenes economic and geopolitical animation is very heavily dictated by the reality of oil and gas production in the Middle East. Middle East, broadly speaking, the, the nations that have money and power there have nothing to sell the world of significance except oil and gas. They don't sell airplanes, sell diamonds. They don't <laughs> produce computers. They don't produce much intellectual property outside of Israel. It's all about oil and gas, not because that's unimportant. So let me let me context this way. And then uh, I'll say a few things about nuclear energy. We can talk about it. The world, to say the world needs energy is like saying humans need oxygen. There's nothing, nothing exists without energy. Nothing in civilization, life doesn't exist. The universe doesn't exist. It's foundational. Uh, energy is not a limited thing. It's unlimited. There's an unlimited supply of energy. There are no quotes of limits to energy. The only limits we have are in our imagination and the understanding the physics and building the machines to tap what is functionally an unlimited supply of energy in the universe. Energy is essential to build things, operate things, create safety, convenience, beauty. All those things require energy. Larger populations wanting more of those things always use more energy, always and forever through all of history. <clears throat> I say that because a lot of the uh, policy and po political planning coming out of the International Energy Agency these days are centered on the belief, which I dispute, for which because the other is zero evidence in history, the belief that we can reduce growth of energy consumption while still having economic growth. We cannot. Economic growth, flourishing, safety, beauty, comfort, all come with more energy, not just more people creating any more energy, not just, not just getting the poor of the world, which are billions, to live at a fractional level as we do, requiring more energy. But more fundamentally, 
this is an important philosophical point, which underpins my research. Humans do something unique uh, in nature. We invent energy demands. What I mean by that is our innovation, our creativity, our entrepreneurship, uh, technology advancements, all these things result in the need to use energy for things other than survival. The invention of the airplane invented demand for energy for airplanes. The invention of the car invented demands for energy for cars, to make them and operate them. The invention of the computer created a demand for energy. It didn't exist pre-computer. The list goes on. In fact, as a fundamental point, humans are much better in inventing ways to consume energy than to produce it. We've invented thousands of ways to consume energy and will continue to do so. There are very limited ways to produce energy in the physics of the universe that exists. In fact, to get to why nuclear is interesting, there are essentially just three ways to produce energy useful for the society. And by that, I mean tapping into nature, making machines that can tap into phenomena in nature. And they are simply burning things, capturing the energy in things that move, or capturing atomic phenomena. That's it. It's all energy sources fall into those three buckets. We burn wood, we burn, in fact, a lot of people on the planet still burn dung for their heating purposes. It's shocking, but it's still true. So burning wood, coal, dung, hydrogen, no matter what, it, combustion is a way of releasing energy. It's a chemical phenomena. You enhance it with things like internal combustion or steam engines, but those are machines that capture the energetics of combustion. Then we capture things that move, moving water, moving air, moving people and moving animals. Slavery is a form of capturing uh, motive power of humans, which is what's a very common form of energy capture, and animals, you know, horses pulling car car carriages. But the Everything from tidal power to wind power are about capturing motions and flows that are just natural, tapping into them. And of course, the two iconic atomic phenomena that we, we can now tap into in modern times is our understanding of the phenomena of the photoelectric effect, for which Einstein got the Nobel Prize. That's what he got the prize for, not for, not for E equals MC squared, but for the photoelectric effect, where the release of electrons from exciting an atom gives you electricity the photoelectric effect. And then the, uh, tapping into the nuclear core of the atom, of course, is nuclear fission and fusion, of which we know how to do one of them. Nature and God know how to do the other. We're still trying to figure out how to do fusion. So those are that. That's all you've got. The world gets 80 plus percent of all of its energy from the first combustion. And that's been true for decades. In fact, for a couple centuries. That's hydrogen, uh, that's hydrogen, that's hydrocarbons of coal, oil, and natural gas. Oil is the single largest source of energy for the planet, and has been for a century, close to a century. And it's still the case. In fact, oil powers 97% of all transportation today, and it's only one percentage point decline over the last 20 years. Most of the rest is from burning uh, food, that is ethanol. We turn corn and and and, uh, and cane sugar into ethanol. A trivial percentage, zero point two percent of all transportation comes from using electricity. Just to give you a calibration point. So that's where the world is. Uh, we we use hydrocarbons and have, despite trillions of dollars of spending to avoid using hydrocarbons for the last two decades, the world still gets vast majority of all its energy from hydrocarbons. Put more more pointedly, a hundred percent of everything in society. 100%. There are no exceptions. Use, uses and requires use of hydrocarbons somewhere in the supply chain to make the product or service possible. Not some things, but all things. What we're doing now uses hydrocarbons. Computers use hydrocarbons somewhere in, in the supply chains, unavoidably, because of the physics of energy and the systems we know how to build. <clears throat> so now what we have is a world that's growing. We'd like it to grow. We'll use more energy. And we have this idea of an energy transition that's been extant in the world saying, we're going to transition away from hydrocarbons. We all know why. This has to do with the fact that when you burn any fuel, you produce carbon dioxide. This is, I will say, uh, something that seems political or controversial. This is not a pollutant. It is an intentional product. You create carbon dioxide by combining carbon and oxygen to get an exothermic reaction in chemistry. If you remember your high school chemistry, it's to produce heat. You produce heat by combining carbon and oxygen. It is a intentional activity to release heat. CO2 is the, is the intended, intended product. 
pollutants are things like sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides, lead, you know, all these things that happen to be and can be co-located in the chemicals you're using. And then you want to scrub them out so we don't, you know, contaminate air and water, land, and so forth. <clears throat> I say that because the goal to transition away from, and the claim that we read constantly in newspapers is that we're under we're undergoing an energy transition away from hydrocarbons, oil, gas, and coal towards new technologies, which are principally windmills, wind turbines, solar photovoltaic cells, and batteries to store the electricity from. That's the sort of the epicenter of the claims. So to context, the reality of that claim is that the world today gets a lot of energy from electricity, a lot of electricity from wind and solar, quite a lot, frankly. Uh, right now, I think slightly more than from nuclear energy. We passed that uh, that uh, benchmark uh, last year. But burning wood, the oldest source of energy known to man other than, other than muscle power, burning wood still provides more energy to the world than does wind and solar combined globally or than does nuclear energy. So the excitement now about nuclear energy is it's the only significant source of electricity that's phenomenologically different than everything else. I mean, it is fundamentally different. It's different because the inherent energetics are not just a little bit better, they're roughly a million times better than combustion. Whereas wind and solar are roughly a thousand times worse than combustion in terms of the underlying physics of materials, the amount of materials and land you need to produce a unit of energy, to heat a building, power a computer, move a car, you roughly increase the total footprint of humanity by a thousand fold going the wind solar route. You decrease it a thousand fold or more going the nuclear route. So nuclear energy has always been seen as a, the holy grail, if you like, of energy. If we could tap this phenomenal energy capacity of, of nuclear fission and do it safely and inexpensively, then we really do reach this uh, the nirvana goal of uh, you know unobtainium energy that has almost no land use, almost no material use, almost no downstream impacts. I mean, on a relative basis, you said earlier all energy sources have side effects and negative effects. Of course, they do. You have to mine uranium to make nuclear power plants, which means you have to have mining. You have to use steel and concrete, which means you a lot. Of, you need a lot of metallurgical coal to make the steel. And the concrete, you have to, the list goes on. There's no perfect energy source. There's no perfect anything <laughs> in, in, uh, on earth. Uh, but nuclear energy is uh, seen a resurgence in excitement because of the, uh, the constituency that thinks we can transition away from hydrocarbons now is turning to nuclear energy. I'm delighted. I'm, I've been a long time bull. I like nuclear power plants. I've spent a lot of time in the nuclear industry when I was younger. I worked for a uranium mining company in Canada and a refiner. Uh, I worked on nuclear energy issues in the Reagan White House Science Office, and then the, com the, the triple whammy of three accidents that captivated the world's attention uh, was sort of the stake in the heart of nuclear industry. It was destroyed largely by the environmental movement first, but the stake in the heart was the fear from the accidents. That is, the environmental movement vigorously then and largely vigorously today opposes nuclear energy. That led to huge overruns and costs, construction delays, which of course is fatal by itself. Then if you add in the fear factor amplified by accidents that frighten people, I don't, uh, don't want to denigrate people being frightened, in some cases needlessly frightened with hype, but the three accidents, of course, were Three Mile Island in the United States in 1979, the horrific Chernobyl accident in 1986 in Russia, a nuclear power plant, which is unique, which doesn't exist in the West, uh, uniquely unsafe, by the way. And of course, the Fukushima reactor in, in, uh, in Japan, which frightened people. Didn't, didn't, uh, the only, only accident which actually killed people, killed workers, was the Chernobyl re reactor because of the terrific, horrific design. Three Mile Island injured no one, killed no one. Uh, uh, Fukushima uh, the deaths associated with that were in the panicked evacuations, which were, uh, in hindsight, and at the time, for those who knew, unnecessary, ill-advised, and frightened people. Uh, but it, but it, they had impacts. So here we are today uh, with a world that wants more energy. We're going to burn more coal, more gas, and more oil, because that's what's been going on for the last two decades, despite trillions of spending to avoid it. For those who want more energy, we need more of all. You know, the old line that President Obama used 
I won't say cynically because I, I, I don't want to, but I think he meant it, frankly, at the time. We need all, all the above, which means we need, we shouldn't stop building windmills, solar arrays. You've, they're very useful in specific parts of the world and in specific applications. They cannot replace uh, hydrocarbons at scale. We need to we, we need to and will continue to burn more coal globally because that's happening. In fact, uh, coal use in China, Asia, Vietnam, Indonesia expanding rapidly. We are going to consume more oil for as far as we can see into the future because we can't build electric cars fast enough. It's just not possible. And they also use oil, by the way, <laughs> back to my hydrocarbon point, in the production of the materials and minerals needed to make the electric vehicles. But you, you want to, what you really want is not a, trans, a transition, but addition. So the history of energy, and I'll end up with this point, then we can talk about nukes, how they can, everything about the history of energy for civilization has been additional. We still burn wood, as I said earlier. We still, we still burn coal. We still, we still burn oil. We, we are expanding wind and solar. We will use things like ethanol more in the future than in the past, more biodiesel, you know, food converted uh, chemically into liquid into liquid fuels. All of the history for decades and centuries shows if you drew a graph of continual expansion of energy consumption and production and a continual expansion of all the sources. Now the growth rate of the big ones slows, that's it's an arithmetical reality, and the growth rates of the smaller ones, wind, solar, and hydrogen nukes will grow faster, but all are growing because the world needs all of them. What we've missed in the equation for 50 years now is a vigorous expansion of nuclear energy. That's tragic. And I think that'll start now, but people can't be naive about how long that will take because we have we have let the infrastructure languish, especially in the United States. So that's a, a, a long introduction to sort of frame it, but I hope that helps give a context for where, where nukes fit into the picture. It helps a lot. And it's important for people to understand where the issue lies right now. So you mentioned that um, you mentioned China and they are building coal fire plants. But yeah. you also wrote in in Focus Quarterly, which I recommend everybody should go read Mark's article in in Focus Quarterly, um, that they are building more than one third of the nuclear plants currently right. being built in the world. Right. How does that compare to us? And I guess that tells us something about how China <laughs> sees the future. Yeah, well, China sees the future and all of the above. So they're, they're, built, they're building the most windmills, the most solar arrays. They supply 98% of the world's solar photovoltaic cells, 98%. And it's, the reason they can do that is because they use their coal-fired grids to produce cheap electricity to manufacture silicon. Silicon is incredibly energy intensive to fabricate, more so than steel and aluminum. So that's why they are able to do it. They, they cost compete. But they're doing all of it. They're building hydro dams. They're expanding, they're expanding their nuclear fleet because they need all the above, and as does all the emerging markets, as do we, by the way. We we can abandon uh, coal uh, in time because we have so much natural gas, we produce it so cheaply. But from a global perspective, the world still needs coal. So China's doing that. China's uh, building the nuclear reactors that America designed, uh, not accidentally and not by theft. Uh, you know, the Clinton administration, I believe, roughly speaking, the US entered into agreements to essentially sell the technology to tie it to China, uh, which is fine. I mean, this you know, I'm not I'm not, I'm not objecting to that on any moral or, or political basis, but the, the practical reality is that these are designs that originated here. They've been improved somewhat in China. The Russians are still building nuclear power plants and supplying the world with Russian light water reactors, not the Chernobyl style reactors, but the U.S. style reactors. Um, and they can build them relatively quickly. France has announced that they want to double their nuclear fleet. I believe they will. Norway is, wants to build nuclear power plants. Denmark does. Finland has built some. In the United States, I, I, will, I can't say we're building zero because we're, we're not building zero. There are several small reactors that are uh, privately funded and also some Department of Energy funded uh, prototype reactors under construction, a few. Uh, but these are these are prototype plants uh, designed to prove a principle of a new class of reactor. Right now, the kinds of reactors that we know how to build, the big ones, they're called light water reactors, that the world is building, China, Russia, you know, Finland, Sweden, those reactors were building zero. We added two to the American fleet, just two new ones 
in the last 40 years. And we're building zero of those now, zero, none. So <clears throat> you've raised a couple of questions in that last one. So you said that the Russians are now not using the Chernobyl model, they're using the US model. Um, is this going to help people get over their fear of nuclear plants? Because it seems to me that Chernobyl is still hangs over there as sure. we, we don't want another one of those. Are you reasonably yeah. comfortable that the Russians have moved on to bigger and better, or at <laughs> least better and safer? That's well, one question. Yeah. So go with well, that first. The the Chernobyl style reactor is a couple, I think two or three of them still operating. So that's worrisome from a safety perspective, but they aren't building those. Uh, I think, you know, the Russian engineers are very good engineers. Let's set, you know, setting aside the obvious politics, uh, it's not a, a hidden elephant in the room, the politics of Ukrainian invasion and so forth. They're extremely good engineers. They build very good reactors. The light water reactor designs are very safe. Uh, in fact, no light water reactor has led to the, the death of a, any any uh, a worker or member of the public in the history of nuclear power. The This is a, it, it's an astonishing record. I mean, you think there's been something like 500 of these gigawatt scale, like gigawatts, a thousand megawatts. These are the kind of nuclear power plants that can supply one of them, a city of 500,000, just one power plant. We, the world's built over 500 of them, uh, 400 plus are still running. There's 90 of them in the United States. There's no industrial sector with a safety track record like that at that scale. So it's remarkable, but people are afraid of them and they're afraid of them for exactly the same reason they were afraid when Three Mile Island happened. I'll date, I'll date myself. Uh, I, <laughs> I, was a young, I was a young advisor to the commercial nuclear industry in the United States when the accident at Three Mile Island happened. I had just moved to the United States as an immigrant from Canada, uh, an escapee from the cold, barren North. Whatever. <laughs> Which is, which is full of uranium, gold, and oil. and Anyway, and uh, I spent the week of the accident at Three of Mile Island at the site. And uh, my friend at the time was a journalist who I drove up to the uh, to Middletown with. So the town next to the, the island is called Middletown, Pennsylvania, outside of Harrisburg. As we're driving up there, the news media was full. This was the day one of the accident. The accident took seven days to unfold. Nuclear accidents are slow moving. They're not like uh, explosions. And we know in hindsight that that reactor did melt down. It melted the fuel, the, the dreaded, quote, meltdown. And as we we're driving towards the site, my friend was freaking out and to use the, the jargon he was, because the governor of Pennsylvania at that time announced a, quote, precautionary evacuation because he was under a lot of political pressure to do that because of the media hype of the potential for an explosion, a nuclear explosion. So the first thing that's locked into people's heads is the uh, idea that a commercial reactor can explode like a nuclear bomb. Right. It can't. It can't. It's okay. not. This is not a design principle in the sense that, gee, we have safety features. Or not. They, a nuclear power plant can no long, no more explode like a nuclear bomb than a loaf of bread can be lit on fire. The chemical energy in bread can be released to your digestive system. For people who are from rural America or rural Canada, like my family. They know that the grain you use to make bread, when it's grain in silos and aerated, can actually lead to explosions. Grain silo explosions do happen. So the two designs are very different. If you like the grain silo the, with aerosolized wheat and bread, nuclear power plants and nuclear weapons are as far apart as those two phenomenologies. Then the next thing you have is the Chernobyl reactor, which had a chemical explosion in, induced by nuclear heat, right? It lit... Uh, it, they, it got so hot, it separated the, the water into uh, oxygen and hydrogen. They recombine and explode, chemical explosion. Did not have a containment dome. This is a four foot thick reinforced steel and concrete building that all light water reactors have to contain that kind of chemical reaction, chemical explosion. Just had a simple steel building, a hut, which blew it blew open. And so that reactor did kill workers who went in to try to solve the problem of tamping down the runaway uh, chemical reactions scares people. I, I I get it. I mean, it's, it was very frightening. But the linkage between the nuclear weapons and then after the development of, of uh, commercial nuclear energy and the horrific experience of having to use nuclear weapons in World War II, the 1950s spate of movies of 
giant ants, giant cockroaches, giant women run run amok, you know, exposed to radioactivity. Godzilla as a, as a was a derivative from the idea of radiation exposure. Spider Man is a you know a radioactive spider. You know, bit uh, that the hapless scientist turned him into. All this mythology is firmly embedded in many people's heads, if not okay. consciously, subconsciously. All of okay. it's mythological and silly, but it scares people. Well, it scares people, but the interesting point here is, uh, based on what you've just said, it doesn't scare everybody. So <laughs> both countries that are adversarial to the United States, which would be Russia and China, or at least competitive with the United States, seem to have gotten over the fear. Um, and then you talk about a bunch of friends of ours, good friends of ours, Norway and Denmark and France and Sweden. Um, they're going ahead. So yeah. clearly, at many ends of the political spectrum, countries have looked at this problem. And they've said, OK, I want to go do that. Germany, on the other hand, is apparently closing its last nuclear plant. Right. And I find that surprising because the Germans had been fairly well invested, I understood, in nuclear energy. Yeah. Yeah, What's a our problem? What's stopping the United States of America if all these other countries yeah. can catch on? What are what's our problem? The German decision is no other word other than insane. Well, okay, I'll go with that. Yeah, I say it's just insane. Close nuclear plants when they have a, a natural gas problem with Gazprom in Russia, and they're opening coal plants instead. Just a, just insane. I don't know what happened to the Germans. Uh, the, our problem is. Uh, it, short term and long term. Short term, the the our problem is environmentalist extremism, which seems ironic. And mid long term, it's the loss of our infrastructure to build nuclear plants, which is a consequence of environmental extremism. But that's the law. So by by environmental extremists, what I mean is, and you can find this by using Dr. Google and seeing what environmental groups are now saying about nuclear energy. Most of them vigorously oppose the expansion of nuclear energy still. And they will continue to oppose it. And as a consequence of that, they will use the current regulatory and legal system in the United States to oppose and cause construction delays and cost overruns as they did 30 and 40 years ago, which was consequential. So we, we that is our short-term problem. It's not that the American public polls show, Gallup and other polls, support nuclear energy, uh, think it can be done safely and acceptably. So there's general support. I think I agree there's general bipartisan political support, but it's not full on. And the environmental movement has not gone on board. The midterm problem is that we've abandoned the, because we haven't been building them for a long time. We don't have the infrastructure of engineers, of welders, nuclear qualified welders, electricians, the whole supply chain from mining to producing nuclear fuel. We depend on Russia, Russia, of all places, for a lot of our refined uranium, uh, we're trying to. We're, we depend on other countries for the mined uranium. We depend on uh, manufacturers to make the fuel. You don't. You don't just dig uranium up and burn it, right? You have to process it electrochemically into a material that's useful, and that takes industries and times. So we don't have a significant scale, so it takes money and time. So short term, we have a political problem to. I think it's fixable. I think a vigorous bipartisan legislation different than what recently passed, which was mostly, so to be fair, there was a bipartisan legislation recently right. passed, a pro-nuclear legislation, but most of what they promoted was virtue signaling and studying. You know, we need nuclear energy, so let's study it. Which what we really need is reform the legislation and regulations so that we can uh, actually get these things built and inspire a in private investment in new industry. Do you see anybody now? I'm going to phrase this carefully because we're about to have an election. But <laughs> do you see no? But seriously, do you see anybody yeah. on the Hill? Because yeah. legislation has to come from there. That yes. is a proponent of nuclear energy and who might be a person who could lead the charge. Um, again, recognizing that things may change in November. But is there anyone up there doing it? Yeah, I mean, there's no question. Some of, uh, and both sides, again, uh, there there is a bipartisan support for the idea. What we don't have is bipartisan support for the solution. Okay. And to put it in the simplest form, the legislation will have to hew to reasonable safety procedures and regulations that that most people would agree make sense. 
but constrain the ability for frivolous delays and, and slowdowns. This requires substantial reform of, of the national, you know, what's called NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. This is constraining all forms of industrial expansion, whether it's factories, mines of all kinds, the mine nickel and, and copper in America, all across the industrial sector, not just nuclear energy. We have constraints in America. The reason we import all these critical materials is because of our constraints, not because other people are better at it. There's very little political appetite to get the kind of consensus required for radical, which we really need, radical reform of constraints on American industry. That will have to come from a president, a president's bully pulpit with, a, with an agreeable Congress that's being pushed by a president can make big changes, which is why presidential elections are consequential. I think Congress really matters. They pass the laws, but I, and I don't want to be unkind to any specific congressman or senator, but by and large, they follow, not lead. And I, I don't mean this in the, to be, there are leaders, um, but okay. generally speaking, the architecture, my experience as an adopted American <laughs> is that the bully pulpit really matters. Having uh arm twisting and cajoling and negotiating to get the consensus you need. It has to be typically bipartisan to make meaningful and substantial changes in regulations and legislation. That's what has to happen. So I think what I'm hearing is, first of all, large scale industrial policy. We're not really just talking about nuclear energy. We're talking about yeah. large scale industrial policy and presidents various of them and Congress people of various parties have said things about onshoring industry to the United mm -hmm. States and bringing yeah. back industry and improving American industry and all of those things that we, <clears throat> excuse me, would definitely like to see us do. Yeah. But all of that requires more energy, right? Yes. You, you well, bring yeah. factories back. Yeah. You want to yeah. build batteries here. Yeah. You need to energize all those things. So there's no way it seems to me that you can divorce a conversation about energy, nuclear or otherwise, right. from industrial policy and onshoring policy. Well, they're all they're they're all relate, and that is that you're exactly right. Uh, you don't onshore uranium mining and refining without having the regulations legislation that make the businesses that want to do it choose to do it here. No amount of subsidies can help if it takes you twenty years to never to get a permit. It just doesn't matter. So some of the current ambitious plans to onshore factories, especially you know, semiconductor chip fabs, uh, as has been widely reported recently, are not happening despite the subsidies. The reason they're not happening is because, to your point, the collateral issues uh, on regulations matter. And the energy part really matters. Industrial sector is energy intensive. If you reshore stuff, you're going to increase energy consumption and most importantly, the energy has to be cheap and reliable. All the current U.S. energy policies that are in play at the state and federal level, not all, in 20 states and the federal government are taking the United States towards more expensive energy. You're not going to relocate a factory in America that uses lots of energy if you think there's a, a chance that by the time you finish building it, you'll be facing energy costs that are higher, not lower. So it creates friction. And that's what's going on right now. The reason we're having trouble reshoring is not just that we don't have enough subsidies, which by and large, I oppose. There's some targeted subsidies I, I'm not philosophically opposed to. We have the failure to recognize, to your point, that these policies increase energy demand and demand for cheap energy that's reliable. What the the progressives, and I, I say that because this is where the movement resides primarily, claim is that wind and solar are cheaper than conventional energy. And so we just have to expand wind and solar faster and we'll get what we want. The problem with that claim, not to go down that rabbit hole, is that we've built lots of wind and solar around the world already, many states and many European countries. And in every single country and state where we've expanded wind and solar, the cost of energy has gone up, not down, without exception. Could you explain why that happens? <laughs> I mean, I don't I don't know. Can you explain yeah. it? Yeah. Well, because energy systems costs have to relate to the system. So in shortest answer, easiest one is everyone knows the wind doesn't blow all the time, the sun doesn't shine all the time. So do but other kinds of power plants operate just about all the time. 
except for maintenance and fit, physical failures. What that means is that the things that don't operate all the time, you have to spend some money somehow to provide energy when they're not running. So that that that's just money. Well, it's, yes, but you're now creating a system. Put simplistically, imagine if the car that I tell you you are allowed to drive doesn't work every time you turn the key on, but works a third of the time you turn the key on. The other two thirds of the time, you're gonna to have to use a backup car that will always turn on when you turn the key. So you have to buy two cars, but I'm gonna pass a law that says that you must own the car that only operates a third of the time you try to use it. And so that has a cost, obviously. And you could say, well, but I'm doing it for other reasons because that a preferred car that's unreliable has other features. That's fine, but it still has a cost. One of the that's wind and solar are, are by definition that class of energy source. That means the systems that run to make sure electricity is available all the time become more expensive. And that's just what happened. I think we're getting a much fuller picture, which um, <laughs> which I think is important because if you want to support the right kinds of policies, both industrial policies and energy policies, the whole picture is necessary, which yeah. brings us to another point. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that people often raise as a problem with nuclear energy is the issue of nuclear waste. Yeah, And sure. they kind of think about it, I think, as something you put in a trash bag and throw in your trash can, and boy, isn't that a bad idea. It sure is. What do you, what do, you do with it? What are the technologies that yeah. we should be pursuing to make it um, not scary and very reasonable? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so safety and waste are the well. There's three the three the three bugaboos for nu the, for nukes are proliferation, which we've talked about, which briefly, but it's isolating the technology knowledge that you gain and engineering knowledge you gain in making commercial reactors from bleeding into learning how to develop the technologies to make weapons or make the materials for it. That that's a Pandora's box problem, which we can't fix by not building nuclear power plants. That's just we know that if no other reason than North Korea and Iran. It's the the genies out of the bottle, as they say, for better or for worse. Our non-proliferation goals should be focused on other approaches. Uh, safety we talked about. Safety is a bugaboo. Uh, they are very they're very safe, and the new designs are even safer. Waste. You're, so the two two things about nuclear energy that are unique: the waste is radioactive. Everybody knows that. Radioactivity, if it's intense enough, is hazardous. Um, so that's like the, I guess the Gen Z, that's a no da. Uh, you don't want to be exposed to high levels of radioactivity. This is the key thing. How do you get exposed to it? That's the key question. And the other feature of nuclear waste is that its volume is, and I say this without, it's, it's trivial in scale terms. That is the quantity of material that we call waste that we can no longer use after you've finished using the fuel is millions of fold smaller than the quantities of waste associated with all other energy forms. This is tiny quantities. So what that means is that you can devote a, a lot of money on a relative basis to a very small volume of material. The other thing is sort of the mental nomenclature. Waste goes in the garbage can. You know, Think of waste as sludge. A, a nuclear fuel goes into a power plant. It's a, it's a ceramic-like material held in steel, you know, a, a metal rods or zirconium rods. It's metal-like rods. The fuel pellets are a, a as I said, a ceramic-like material, a tiny. And then the nuclear uh, nuclear fission takes place over a period of years. As the, and then the the, the fuel rods self-contaminate. That the fission results in fission products that when you split the uranium atom, you get two different atoms, which are contained inside invisibly in the same ceramic material. They don't go anywhere. It's a, an atomic phenomenon. So the fuel rod, when it's finished being useful, looks exactly the same as a fuel rod when it went in, but it's now called waste. If you put it in there, you take it out. If I took a picture of it, it looks the same. The big difference between them is that when it comes out, it's intensely radioactive because the Nuclear fission is intended to release heat. That intention results in two smaller product atoms than uranium, which are radioactive. They decay. They create radioactivity. So what you do with that identical looking hot, it's physically hot because of the heat from the 
the radioactivity and it's radioactive. So you would not want to be near one. It would, it would kill you if you stood beside it. it. It's impossible for you to stand beside it. There's no mechanism for a human being to be near it, but they re remotely control go into giant what look like swimming pools to cool off, physically cool off. And the water shields the radioactivity and it decays. Radioactivity decays over time. The reason it decays is that that's what the radioactivity is. It's the atom falling apart in its particles. That's the radioactivity. But as it falls apart, it's decaying. It stops and it just over time becomes less and less hot, less radioactive. So then you're left with this ceramic-like material contained in metal rods that some years later after it's cooled off is, quote, waste. Here's the important part. Something like two-thirds to three-quarters of the original fuel value of that fuel rod is still there, unused. So recycling. Exactly. So the thing that should really happen is you can chemically recycle, reprocess that material without mining, opening a single other new mine. We know how to do that. We've been doing it for decades and decades. The French do it in their process. So the recycling and reprocessing, which you would think would appeal to people who don't want who don't want new mines and you know all, all and the recycling mantra: you recycle, reuse. What that does, if you do that, is is reduced by a hundredfold the amount of new mining you need to do, which you think environmentalists would love. It also reduces by volume by a hundredfold the volume of things left over the fission products that are radioactive that you then encase in it, you convert into a glass-like material that is now true quote waste. But again, it's a glass-like material uh, that is unuseful, should be protected. You don't want to stand here, but it can't, it doesn't, it's not a gas, it's not a liquid. It doesn't leak into the environment. It's got nowhere to go. And that's where we talk about repositories, where you would take that finally and bury it deep in the ground where people and animals and nature can't get near it. So that's the whole, that's the, I mean, that, that's a long explanation. So does, it sounds like, well, what, so why aren't we doing that? Well, the French are. So why aren't we doing that? I'll say this extreme environmental movement again. Uh, okay. they, they also, to be fair, the process of, re, of recycling the material means that it gives you a means to extract the weapons grade uranium and plutonium out of that fuel and concentrate it to make a weapon. The way we get weapons grade material is we design reactors specifically to produce weapons grade material, reprocess the fuel to extract that, make a weapon and so forth. That's the weapons making process. It is technically true that that technology could be dual used. Of course that's true. And that's so, what we do. So is that what, let's go to the fears of some of our listeners. Um, yeah. When the Iranians build factories and they say that they want a uh, non-weapons program, they simply want um, nuclear energy for themselves. Is that right. the great fear that they are going to reprocess things into their uh, weapons program? We know of they course. have one. So yeah. that's what we're worried about. Sure, of course. And, and, uh, and I would... I don't have any proof, uh, uh, except that I would b believe they're very good engineers and scientists in Iran, uh, always have been. I, yeah. I have no doubt that that's exactly what they're doing. The reason, you, it's easy to be transparent on the commercial reactor program. Uh, they have refused the international inspectors. The reason you would do that is because you're in fact doing what I just described. Uh, so when you say I'm pledging to have a commercial reactor and keep the whole th the thing contained away from transparent processes that are easy to see that could be weaponized if I could go in and look at the facility. If I can't go and look at the facility, I don't know whether they're in fact weaponizing the, the right. chemical process. So sure, I, I, I mean, it's an easy bet. Of course they are, of course they've done that. Okay. That's how you get the material. Uh, and there's two classes of material chasing, but they, but they relate to that. Countries like uh, Saudi Arabia, which have a commercial nuclear power path to science, to the best of my knowledge, have agreed to the full transparency of international community and the design of the reactor and its operation and who operates it so that it's a purely done to produce electricity and there's no mechanism and availability to their engineers and scientists to, uh, to do what the Iranians are doing. I think the Saudis are counting on us to protect them, apparently, as opposed okay. to, but that, that may not last forever. <laughs> that's a whole different... Um... I know. set of issues. But I wanted to be clear on what it was that the Iranians 
could be doing that is is yeah. worrisome for us. And you've made that clear. Sorry, yeah. I appreciate it. Um, we have time for one more question. And somebody asked, uh, you mentioned small nuclear reactors that we yeah. are not building large ones. Can you can you tell us what those small ones do? Are they functionally the same as the big ones? Are they are they less capable? What does that mean? A small yeah. reactor? That's the, that's the really popular nomenclature now, small modular reactors, small nuclear reactors. The modular part comes from the desire to lower costs by building the, the smaller in factories and moving identical modules to a big site, right? That's that logic. But they're still big reactors. So again, a thousand megawatts, a typical big reactor. The small modular reactors are typically two to 300 megawatts each and you assemble three to five of them in a single site to get the thousand megawatts. But what people generally mean by small is nuclear power plants that be small enough to power a ship, right? Um, which we, we power submarines and aircraft carriers uh, with those in the United States. And there there was, uh, and, the, and the Russians, by the way, have several nuclear powered icebreakers. Uh, the benefit of a nuclear powered ship is that it, 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 given the reactor designs, it doesn't have to ever come to shore for fuel just to let people get off at least about for five or 10 years. <laughs> That's a long fuel load. And of course, small reactors could be small enough to power a, a building or a data center or a spaceship. So nuclear power plants are like all energy machines. They can range in size. So I'll use airplanes as an example. You have A380s and 747s, and we have small one-seater airplanes, everything in between. Uh, what's the difference between them? It's obvious as soon as I state that. There's a really big difference in how you engineer an A380 and a, and a small Cessna, but they both have wings and they both have combustion engines. So the same phenomenology is being used same for nuclear power. It's a very, very different design. And the challenge is that the, the big reactors were pursued because of the, the idea, which is true in all engineering, of economies of scale. The ultimate kilowatt hour produced is typically cheaper as you build economies of scale, which is why we have skyscrapers instead of lots of small offices, why we have big factories instead of small ones. However, there's lots of times where you don't, you can't use the big reactor. You can't get power plants to it, transmission lines. Ship's a good example. There are roughly uh, 90 to 100 new designs underway for different uh, private and public you know, government organizations designing new classes of small reactors. From reactors uh, the size of your kitchen refrigerator wow. that NASA has built for the Mars mission, because Mars is too far from the sun for solar to be useful. So you're going to want a reactor that would power a house, five or 10 kilowatts. That's what a big house is, 10 kilowatts. Technically feasible, they already exist. Reactors that would power ships, which is a few megawatts. Uh, the, when you'd go, if you ever take a cruise on a, a ship, it's electrically propelled these days. They have diesel generators that run electric motors for, for cruise ships. So instead of the diesel generator, that's a, say a two to three megawatts, you could use a two to three megawatt nuclear reactor. Ship would never burn fuel, never come to shore. All these things are technically feasible. Uh, no one knows yet how to build them inexpensively at scale. I'm fully confident we'll figure out how to do that. But that takes years, in some cases, a decade or two. All the designs are exciting, uh, so-called mobile reactors, containerized reactors, uh, nuclear power plant this, uh, that could be assembled on site from, say, four shipping containers put in the ground. It would run for 10 years with an on-off switch has no failure mode except doesn't work. So the two modes of operation is it's working or it doesn't. It can't blow up, can't melt down. It runs for a decade. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I mean, I think what that would do for rural communities, for Africa. So these are these are sort of the kinds of exciting things that are happening in nuclear energy. All of them will happen. Um, I think some of them will happen faster than my pessimism, which was, uh, would say it would take decades. I think it's possible to have many of those reactors available in a decade. And there are engineers I, I know personally that believe they can get their companies to produce commercial reactors like the ones I described, operational and ready to buy within this decade, technically feasible. Uh, we'll, we'll see. I think, I think it's going to happen. Whether the regulations will permit it, go back to our regulatory issue, and then whether this, the upstream fuel cycle will exist, because we're going to need thousands of those kinds of reactors, not hundreds. Tens of thousands. What well, we already build, you know, the the jet engine on a uh, on a on an aircraft that you you we all fly, 
that's a uh, roughly 10 to 20 megawatt engine. It's a big engine in, in power terms. Uh, we use those exact same kind of engines to make electricity too. That's the same aeroderivative turbines. We build thousands of those, something like seven to 10,000 of those a year to power airplanes. It's not crazy to think we could build seven to 10,000 20 megawatt nuclear power plants a year. Be very exciting. But you have to build the fuel system to supply them. The airplanes are running on uh, aviation fuel, diesel fuel, basically. We know how to do that. We've been doing it for a century. We don't have the infrastructure to build the equivalent fuel for 10,000 nuclear power plants being built a year. We, we know how to build it. We just haven't built it. So that'll take years to, to put in play, too. Okay. So... To wrap up, we're coming to the end of the program, okay. and people who listen periodically or all the time, I hope there are lots of people out there listening every week, know that I like to go out on an optimistic note, and <laughs> you were in the middle of one. Yeah. I mean, you're doing a real optimistic thing here, which I really appreciate, um, and then you did the little down thing, which is, you know, we're not <laughs> doing it. So give us an optimistic answer to the question. Yeah. Can we change that? We, yes. We're not doing it to, yes, yeah. we are doing yeah, it. Sure. Absolutely can we change can. that? Yeah. You know, the reason I, I became an American, I'm still a Canadian too, is because uh, many political philosophers who I've read and you've read have said things about the United States, which I think are still true. The United States is a unique um, culture. We, we, we are in a uh, fractious time. When I wrote my book with the subtitle Roaring 2020s, I read a lot about what was going on in the 1920s. Very similar uh, time uh, with the pandemic of 1918 that lasted three years into 1921. We had come off great wars, horrible World War I, okay. the political debates, race riots in America, martial law because of race riots. It was There were a lot of horrible things going on in America. Uh, and people forget. So you can, but we got, we already got through it. We resolved many of them sat, in, in, in largely satisfactory ways. It's, it's the nature of the United States. This has been what's unusual about this country. Uh, I think we'll. I think we'll get through our fractious times based on history, and I think our heterogeneous population has always been heterogeneous. We've always fought vigorously. Fortunately, we're allowed to in a democracy, and I I pray and believe we'll continue to be fundamentally a fractious democracy. And because we're so good at that, because our markets are so fractious, that's also what makes our technology possible. They're closely related phenomenologies. The innovation happens here because it's not top down and we're still largely not top down that that means that we, we ultimately redound to reality and do what needs to be done after trying things that don't work so well so in energy markets that means we've we've figured out we're going to need more oil and gas we're going to need more wind and solar we're going to do all that stuff but we're also figuring out now we need more nukes and we're, uh, we're already seeing evidence to your point of bipartisan agreement we need to get this done it i think it'll get done I really do. I don't know if it'll happen with whoever the next president is. I think there's a decent shot at will because I think both parties on the things that I'm talking about have a high level of convergence. I testified before the U.S. Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee at the end of May on this issue of electric supply and demand. I, I was, and I said this in the hearing, it's, still, it's available online, of course. I was, I've testified for that committee many times before the House and Senate. I was shocked and pleased at the convergence uh, of opinion on the on, on on the underlying facts. We need more electricity. We can build more. We will build more. We need. To... There was convergence instead of uh, I was. It was a, it was a thing of beauty. So so stop. So it's, it's, because it's, gonna it's so positive. <laughs> I want you to stop right there because the idea of convergence, the idea of testifying not, to a bipartisanly happy. Not, not perfect convergence. I'm not naive. Okay. You know what? Was, nobody needs nobody needs perfect. You don't no, get perfect. We, it was moving towards convergence instead of divergence. It was uh, beautiful. In in this context, in our JPC context, we will take moving toward convergence as a very <laughs> optimistic picture. And Mark, we at the JPC are very glad that you came south from Canada and happy to have you as an American. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for illuminating what is really um it shouldn't be, but it is a difficult issue. And so I really appreciate your clarity and your willingness to go into all those little bits. And for everybody out there, uh, we'll be back in two weeks with uh, retired Lieutenant General uh, David Deptula of the U.S. Air Force. And he has been in Gaza and he's going to talk about it. Look for your invitation. Thank you, Mark. Thank you to the audience.